From the Toronto Star, I'm Sabah Itazaz, and this matters. Journalists like to say we want to report the story, not become the story. But what if the story becomes a part of us? If you're held hostage, if you're kidnapped, you're a captive. But how that stays with you, I think, is another form of captivity. You're always a captive. In 2008, Canadian journalist Melissa Fung was reporting in Afghanistan when she was abducted. She survived 28 days of captivity inside a hole in the ground. It's rare and difficult for a journalist to turn the lens on themselves and their trauma. But that's what she's done in her new documentary, Captive. Using her own lived experience, she follows the story of those Nigerian schoolgirls that were kidnapped and brutalized by Boko Haram militants and survived to rebuild their lives. Their currency is girls' bodies. They can be traded in exchange for weapons used as suicide bombers. Melissa joins me now to talk about her documentary, how some survivors are trying to move forward, and the strange complexity of shared trauma that led her to their stories and reflect on her own. Hi, Melissa. Thanks so much for having me, Saba. Melissa, why did you want to tell the story? Oh, that's a long question. I'm going to try to keep it short. I just felt like this story hadn't been told. You know, we all remember in 2014, in April, when the Chibok girls were kidnapped, right? There were 276 girls. We woke up to the headlines. It was horrific. And for me, the more I found out about this, the more I realized that these 276 girls are just a fraction of the girls that Boko Haram has been kidnapping in the years leading up to and since. And so the world's media descended on Nigeria when the Chibok event happened. You know, there was a hashtag, a social media movement, bring back our girls. Michelle Obama, you know, held up his sign, Ellen DeGeneres. But it was only about those 276 girls, you know, and there are thousands still missing. And I just felt like the world needed to know that or be reminded of that. I think it's a very important point. I think a lot of people know about the Chibok girls and the 276 that were abducted. But this is an ongoing thing, right? And there's been thousands of girls. And also, I've been hearing now boys who are being taken away. Do you have any numbers on how many of those have been able to even come back home? Nobody is really keeping track, sadly. You know, even conservative estimates think it could be thousands, that there still could be five to 7,000 girls, boys missing and being held in the forest. And so, you know, in fact, just this week, right, in Kagara, which is northwest, they kidnapped an unknown number of boys from a school. And so that has people concerned that Boko Haram is kind of expanding west now. For a bit of background, can you tell me more about Boko Haram and the insurgency in Nigeria? And why are they abducting school children? Boko Haram was started by a very charismatic preacher named Muhammad Yusuf around 2000, 2001. And he was very charismatic. And, you know, at the time in the Northwest in Nigeria, the education system was falling apart. The economy was bad. So you had like these groups of, you know, unemployed, uneducated young boys. And so Muhammad sort of gave them a community, you know, he gave them a place where they felt like they belonged. He fed them, you know, he introduced them to girls, gave them money. And then he started attacking the government. He preaches a very Salafist Islam, right? And so anybody who is not Salafist is an infidel. And that includes other Muslims. And so, you know, he started attacking police stations. He started attacking leaders, political leaders, and so getting more violent. And in 2009, the Nigerian government decided they had to kind of neutralize him. So they burned down his mosque. And he died in custody, which, you know, many people believe was kind of an extrajudicial killing. And, you know, the government thought they were done with him. But then a year later, a successor named Abu Bakr Shakao emerged and the group became even more violent. You know, 
They bombed the national police headquarters in Abuja and the UN building in 2011. And Chacao really sees himself as the opposition to the government. And he wants to set up his own Islamist state in the Northwest. And so that's what they've been doing. They've been overrunning villages, taking territory, you know, either killing or co-opting men and boys, and then taking the women into the Sambisa forest, which is where they're operating out of these days. So, Melissa, coming back to your film, tell me about the girls in your films. From what I understand, these are not the Chiba girls. Tell us more about who these girls are and what happened to them. They are not the Chiba girls. And that was my whole reason that I wanted to make this film, because I wanted to let people know that it's not just about the Chiba girls. So my three girls, Asmao Gambo and Zara, were all kidnapped and taken into the forest when Boko Haram ran over their villages. You know, they've seen their parents killed, they've seen relatives killed, their whole villages destroyed. And then they themselves taken into the forest and kind of married off to Boko Haram fighters. And, you know, Asma was just 12 years old when this happened to her, right? So there's no limit when it comes to sort of the degree of violence that Boko Haram really, you know, perpetuates. They don't care. They do what they want. They go into a village and they just take people. And it's still happening. It's still ongoing. And from your conversations with these girls... I know these are really difficult conversations to have, but were you able to get some sense of what kind of life they were leading in captivity? And then how did they manage to escape? I'll just give you one example. I won't tell you like all three girls, but Asmao, the 12-year-old, was married off to a fighter. And, you know, she is a girl of few words, but she did say that, you know, she was beaten up by her husband a lot. And husband, I'll put in quotes, right? Because it wasn't her choice. He complained that she didn't know how to cook. You know, he would go off and fight with Boko Haram during the day and at night come back and beat her. And that was kind of the life she lived until she managed to escape. And she was taken and kidnapped at the same time as her whole family. So the whole family was taken into the forest. She and her mother and her sister and her father, sadly, she'd never seen her father again. And she managed to reunite with her mother when they were both escaping. You know, that first day they were taken, her mother, Hawa, tells me that they told her, your daughter is no longer yours. She belongs to Abu Bakr Shakal. And, you know, Hawa said she fainted. And just the thought of your daughter not being yours anymore, right? And in the hands of militants who God knows what they could be doing to her. It's unimaginable. And from what I understand, a lot of these girls and these captive individuals, they're able to escape whenever there's a military attack or there's some kind of raid. And in that chaos, they somehow manage to return to their community, right? Yeah, that's how a lot of these girls and women, you know, actually manage to escape because the government occasionally goes in, drops bombs, and then it's under the chaos, you know, they manage to be able to run away. And so that is how Hawa and Asmao escaped. Zara did it on her own. She, you know, said she needed to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and just kept walking. So there are girls who escape every day and then girls who are kidnapped every day. We'll be right back. want to talk more about their lives after they get back but I want to talk about you a little bit in a way you have this unique lens on the story as well informed by your own trauma and I say this as someone who's been through something similar where it's been triggering but at the same time it allows me to feel and tell a story like no other potentially could who hasn't been through that how did your personal experience your trauma sort of affect your time there and your relationship with the girls if if you would like to talk about that. I think I was very open with the girls. You know, when I first met them, I, you know, made sure that I wasn't just another Western journalist coming to take their stories, right? I, you know, made sure they knew my background, 
that I had a similar experience, not the same, of course, but a similar experience. And I was very open. I said, you can ask me anything about what happened. And they were very curious because, you know, they had heard about the Taliban from their, you know, husbands, the Boko Haram husbands. And so they were very curious about what the Taliban were like, what my kidnappers fed me, where they kept me. And I answered all their questions because I just felt like I couldn't ask them the same questions and keep this to myself. And so it became more like a sharing of experiences rather than, you know, an interview, so to speak. It's kind of like you and I having this conversation now, you know, it's not just taking, we're bringing... Exchanging. Yeah, exchanging our experiences, right? And that's what we bring to our reporting is our own experience. And I think that sometimes, you know, we forget how important that is when it comes to telling people's stories. And what has life been like for these girls since they escaped? I know that covering militancy and extremism in certain regions of Pakistan, the people who are affected by it, it comes with a lot of emotional and psychological scars that run deep. And while many provide and talk of sending humanitarian aid, not much thought is given to the trauma aspect of all this. Do you feel that this has been the case in Nigeria as well for these survivors? I think there are two things and that, you know, the mental health aspect and trauma counseling is a big part of what is still missing. But, you know, even before that, these girls, when they escape, they are often shunned by their own communities, right? Because Boko Haram has been using girls who don't agree to get married as suicide bombers. You know, there was a study in four years, you know, Boko Haram had sent more than 400 girls and women into suicide bombing situations. And, you know, no other militant group has used girls the same way. And so no wonder the communities, when they see a girl who's escaped coming in, there's a lack of trust. And so, you know, you think you've escaped, right? The community, I'm going to have support and they don't. And so that's, you know, another trauma trauma on top of their trauma. And so that's when, you know, counseling, the idea of psychotherapy, which is something that isn't very widespread in that part of the world, is so important. And these girls, they're also coping and moving forward in different ways, right? Aisha, for example, who's expressing her agency and anger in a very unique way. Tell me a little bit about her. You're talking about Aisha the hunter? The hunter, yeah. The hunter. Okay, so she's a really interesting character. She was the youngest of 10 children of a hunter and the only girl. And she followed in her father's footsteps. And a few years ago, the government formed a civilian joint task force of these hunting groups in the north to help them root out Boko Haram. And so these groups, you know, it's kind of led to a lot of other issues, which we don't have time to get into. But Aisha, she's the head of this group of men, these group of hunters, and they've been going into the forest and rescuing girls, getting into, you know, gunfights with Boko Haram, confiscating weapons, handing Boko Haram fighters over to the government. And so really part of the fight against Boko Haram. And as she says, yeah, I hunt them down. And, you know, that's justice. Talk to me about your journalistic decision to have that personal angle there, which is rare. Did it make you feel more vulnerable covering the story in this way? How does making a film like that impact you? Does it help? Is it triggering, cathartic, or maybe both? I'll be honest with you. I fought it, right? I just wanted to go tell a story about these girls, you know, and I fought it. I just said, my own story has been told. And as you know, no journalist wants to be the story, right? And I've already been the story because of what happened to me. And so, you know, I fought it and fought it and fought it. And it wasn't until Shelley Saywell came on board and she should really have director credits. She is, you know, I think one of the country's best known and most kind of compassionate documentary filmmakers. And she was the one who convinced me that, you know, my experience could be the bridge for the audience to help them access the girls' stories kind of in a more intimate way, you know, and I always kind of fought when we put my voice in, right? Oh, do we really need to hear from me? And sometimes I still think, oh, maybe we didn't need to hear from me then. But I've come to see now that because of my unique perspective, it sort of helped the girls open up. And I think that it does help the viewer get to know them a little bit more intimately. And I've always felt that through telling these stories, the subject and the storyteller are both changed in some way, like you said, with the sharing of experience or exchanging of information. 
Do you think about what kind of mark these girls left on you? And if you had any impact on them, did you change each other through the making of this documentary? Well, I know they changed me because they completely inspired me. You know, they have such faith and resilience, you know, in a place where they don't have access to even half the things I had access to when I came back right? I had, you know, the best trauma therapist I could find, you know, with them, I had to take them to meet Dr. Akilu. So they were just doing their best to rebuild their lives, you know, and it was through faith and community and just their own determination to reclaim what they had lost. It was really inspiring. And in terms of what I might have given them, I'm trying to encourage them to continue their education. So right now we found them a boarding school. Unfortunately, the grades had fallen so far behind that the boarding school asked them to leave. So Kabir, the local journalist who I've been working with all this time, found them a day school. We got them a tutor. Then the pandemic happened. Schools closed. They went back to their villages. Now we're in the process of looking for a new school. Hopefully we'll have some news on that soon. Let's hope that it's positive. And the point where you leave them in the film, do you have a sense of what's next in their lives? We've been talking about the social political problems, the trauma of what they carry. Are you sure that they will have the access to the education and the future and opportunity that they went through so much hardship for? When I leave them in the film, I don't really leave them because we've been doing all this searching for schools since I left them. I have told them that as long as they want to keep going to school, you know, I will support them, right? And I hope that they do because, you know, Zara says she was the best student before she was kidnapped and she wanted to be a doctor. So I would love to see her realize that someday. And can other people help? Other people can help, definitely. The best way to do so is donating to an organization that is helping them on the ground. And I feature Neem, N-E-E-M, in the film with Dr. Akilu, but there are other organizations as well who are doing similarly important work. So, you know, if people want to help, that's, I think, the best way is to find an NGO you can trust who's on the ground, locally run, and doing good things. Melissa, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing this very important story with us. Thanks so much for having me, Saba. I was talking to Melissa Fung. She's a Canadian journalist and writer and director of the documentary Captive. You can watch it at tvo.org or TVO's YouTube channel. That's it for today. Thanks so much for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Sabai Tazaz, Adrian Chung, and Raju Mutter. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenham, and our director of programming is J.P. Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. Thank you.